What I've got going on here is today a family up in one of the corner units of our townhome complex was moving out. And they'd moved a couple items they didn't want to keep over by the dumpster so that people could take them if they wanted them. And one of them was this really nice six drawer dresser. It's about mid-range IKEA quality and it is put together as self-assemble hardware. Now the base unit is pretty stiff. It's got like four principal pieces, uh, two verticals, a, a centerpiece, a rear that goes across, and then of course the top. And those with all the drawer slides are put together pretty firmly. There's just a few pieces in between that are loose because that's what usually happens to self-assemble furniture. The drawers were a much worse story. I just got through uh, putting these back together and what I did is I had to remove these two screws and the same two on the other side and this screw here and this screw here which caused this piece to drop out and then allowed this c-shape to pull off and then that left the floor piece loose and the front here is actually a pretty nice piece it does have a fairly solid construction and the, these two uh, vertical pieces here are glued onto the front and it has a nice curve in it even so it, it's a very attractive piece the problem was it was obviously in a child's room of some sort there's sticker residue on the fronts of the drawers and as happens with self-assemble furniture, every piece was loose. So the reason I did that taking apart is that once I had this seashell here as a single piece, I removed two screws at a time, put down wood glue, reassembled it tightly, did the same thing over here, removed these two screws, put glue down on the seam, and then reassembled it tightly, put glue in the slot here, and then reassembled this piece onto the back, and then tipped it upright, dropped this base piece, which is thin, but it has reasonable support from this section right here, dropped that back in, and then put glue on the two assembly pieces here and the hole here, Drop this on, put two more screws back in, two more screws back in, and one more screw back in right there. And already, these things feel like real solid drawers. And that's something people don't necessarily realize when they buy self-assemble furniture. Yes, it is built so that you can put it together quickly using just a screwdriver or maybe an Allen key wrench. And this has both. The drawers use screws. The main unit uses a lot of Allen key pieces. But if you don't put glue on the seams like a proper carpenter would, they will loosen up every single time. But okay, this one here I just got through working on. So let's pick up another one. This one here is a great example. Yeah, I mean, you look at it and you can kind of see that there's that sticker residue there and there. And there's a couple different approaches to this. The first thing I'm going to do, though, is go ahead and get rid of the drawer pull. These are a little better than your average quality. A lot of cheap uh, cabinets will just use a single piece of wood and a, uh, a self-tapping screw. But this one here actually has a threaded screw going into a metal insert. This is one of those inserts that could actually be used as its own little drawer pull if you wanted to use it that way. And in this case, they've added a wood trim. I have here a fairly dark finish. And these stickers, I think they've actually physically damaged it in addition to leaving residue. So just trying to use Goo Gone isn't going to do the trick. Again, this looks like it was probably in a child's room. And so there's a lot of little nicks and scrapes. And I'm not exactly sure what this finish is. It looks like a spray on lacquer. The only thing I can really think of to get these residues off is to go ahead and use acetone. Now, acetone is a uh, really good at dissolving plastics and glues. You put this stuff in a plastic party cup and let it sit around and 10 minutes later, your cup will be half melted and the acetone will be on the ground. Besides that, it also evaporates pretty rapidly. So even right now, this rag feels cold just because of that. But what I'm gonna do is this. This is a little bit treacherous because as you can see, I am in fact removing some of the lacquer. So if I keep going, I'll actually tear it, take it down to bare wood. But what it is doing is it's removing any residue that would get in the way of the next step I wanna do. And I do need to be careful not to go overboard on this because as the acetone is melting the, uh, the plasticizers or polymers or whatever in the uh, finish, it's also making them sticky. So anywhere I rub it, it starts to get sticky and then it starts to pull up the paper towel and actually bond it to the finish. So I don't want to do that. So I'm going to do just enough to make sure I've properly gotten all the surface residue off. In the next step, I'm going to start repairing the damage. So first off, I need a sanding sponge. You can buy these at any hardware or home improvement store. It is a sponge with a very fine grit sandpaper on it. I'm going to go over the whole surface like this. And I'm going to do around the edges too, because when I do the final finishing steps on this, I want to go around the corners so that I get a nice continuous looking finish. 
Ideally, if you do much of this, you should be wearing a dust mask because this does create a lot of very fine powder. Fortunately, I'm not going very deep on these. Tonight, I am just trying to knock down the surface enough that it will accept a uh, refinish nicely. Okay, so there it is. If you didn't already know this, if you haven't done much wood finishing before, you'll notice that even though the grain's kind of hard to see through this dark finish, it does go this way on the front and then goes this way on the sides. And you always want to sand in line with the grain because that means you, any uh, marks you leave with the sandpaper will just blend into the natural grain of the wood. You sand across the grain and you will leave scratches that are very, very hard to get out. Okay, that'll about do it for that step. Now, you'll notice I've left behind a lot of damage and we can start to see where I've started to cut through the lacquer a little bit far. There was a deep scratch here already that was not entirely visible, but I didn't cause that, that was already there. And of course, then we have some residue marks still left over here where the sticker ate into the finish. Next step is to get wood refinisher. I happen to use Minwax, I just like it. Um, I've heard other people say that Minwax is probably the best product for the casual user. The, you know, Varathane and some of those others are carried by other places. Home Depot used to have Minwax and they switched. Ace Hardware still has this. I think Lowe still has this. It's whatever you end up liking and using. I do not like Varathane's polyurethane. We'll get to that step in a minute. The color I chose is called Espresso. It's kind of a medium dark brown with a little hint of red in it. And that happens to be a good match to the existing finish on here. Let's just go ahead and try rubbing this on and see what happens. Ah, look at that. Just like that, you'll notice all of the colors coming back. Even the areas where I went down a little deep are mostly returning to their native form. Now, like this deep scratch here isn't going to be filled by st stain. I'd have to come back and uh, putty that or else do multiple layers of final polyurethane finish and sand down, and it's just not worth it. The main thing is to make sure that I get fresh stain into all these little marks and areas that would otherwise stand out, like that little scratch there. Now, again, this is an oil-based stain. This is not a lacquer, so this is not my final step. But we do need to do this step in order to restore the color before we go to the final polyurethane finish. And actually, I've still got a little bit of sticker residue right here, and I don't know if I'll be able to get all that off or not. I do know, however, that the polyurethane will probably fill all that in, so I don't need to worry about trying to sand it way down at this point. Okay, pro tip. When you wear out your socks, wash them one last time so they're clean, and then save them as paint rags. They work really good for finishing projects like this. Okay, so that's our wood stain step. This is one I was working on earlier. Again, it has the same issue. You can see there's still residue of a sticker mark right there, but I'm fairly sure the polyurethane will fill that in. Now, this here doesn't have to be dry, dry. If you're doing fresh wood, you probably want to stain it and maybe let it cure overnight so the wood really soaks up the uh, oil. But in this case, since I just did a light resurfacing, and I don't mind if I lose a bit of color into the paint rag that I'm gonna to use to spread the polyurethane. I'm just gonna to proceed to the next step like this. Okay, as noted, I am using Minwax. Here's a secret for using polyurethane that not everyone picks up on right away. Start with some of the polyurethane in your mixing cup, which I'm just using this other can here. And then for every three parts polyurethane, put in one part of mineral spirits. Mineral spirits, acetone, lacquer thinner, all these chemicals can be purchased off the shelf at a hardware store, but it's the mineral spirits that works really well for thinning polyurethane. I'm gonna add about one part mineral spirits to about three parts polyurethane, and then I'm gonna swish it. So the reason you thin the polyurethane like this is it makes it very, very much easier to spread without getting a lot of ridiculous bubbles. And what bubbles you do get, if you do this right, will uh, work their way out during the curing. So the secret here is not to go too fast. And once you go over an area, it will start to cure fairly quickly if it is at all warm in your workspace. You really don't wanna work with polyurethane over about 75 to 80 degrees. It just cures too quickly. And once it starts to cure on here, the initial setting step is where the uh, mineral spirits along with the solvent that was originally in the polyurethane flash off. When that happens, it gets really tacky. However, at that step, you're not done yet. It needs about another 12 to 18 hours minimum to properly bond up. The plasticizers in here actually start forming a cross-laced matrix, and that's what makes polyurethane really durable. Certain formulations of it are used on hardwood floors, for example, and that's also why I like it on furniture like this, over and above, say, uh, like a lacquer, or um, some people use tongue oil to finish wood. 
A Danish oil is another one. It basically contains kind of a stain and a resin together. But the polyurethane I really like for a couple of reasons. One is the durability and the other is what you can do with it. In this case, you'll notice I'm using clear satin. So as this dries, it will not have a glass coat. I don't want a gloss coat. The original furniture had kind of a nice matte finish and that's what I'm going for here. What I'll do now is I'm gonna let this cure overnight and tomorrow, roughly 12 hours later when it's mostly set up, I'm gonna come back, take this sanding sponge and just very lightly go over it one time just to take the roughness off it. And then again, using this same blend or maybe even thinning it a little further, I'll go back over it and put one final finishing coat. So there we go. I've got to do that six times, but it'll be worth it because you know, this is like a two, $300 dresser at some point and I'm gonna be able to make it look about 80% of new again. One final thing I don't recommend when you're working with this stuff is to wear your nicest clothes from Old Navy that you also had on for work today. Yes, I am back, and since I tend to learn nothing, I am wearing even nicer clothing than last night in order to do the next step of this refinishing. So, we have here the result of applying the first and really thick coat of polyurethane on top of oil stain, which wasn't entirely dry either. And as a result, it has taken on kind of a thick, shiny sheen, even though this is in fact clear satin. The, the satin polyurethanes, they contain some sort of disruptor that when it cures, it forms like a really microscopic level crackle or orange peel, which is why it takes on that matte finish and doesn't reflect. And when you thin it and then apply it thick, especially on the first coat, it seems to kind of disrupt that and it's sort of glossy. But fortunately, that's easy. We're back to the sanding sponge, but just in case that isn't enough, I also grab this. What you do, or at least what I do, is I like to apply that first really thick coat of polyurethane knowing it won't turn out perfect, but what it will give me is a really thick surface that I can knock down pretty far to take off any imperfections or whatever. And once you have finally sanded that first coat of polyurethane, the second one usually tends to go on really thin and really even. 
and it will look pretty bad once again after I sand it, but as soon as that second coat goes on, it should be magic. And worst case, if I really don't like the second coat, I can knock that one down and do a third. So this is a very forgiving process, just time consuming. Sometimes when doing a thick initial coat, you'll get a little bit of a run, especially like on corners or edges where the polyurethane pooled. I don't see much of that going on in this particular drawer, but of course I've got five more to look at. But once you start sanding this down, if you've created any situation like that, it will start to appear because you'll get like a dark mark that looks hmm, kind of like some of these here where the, I'm seeing uneven levels of sanding and it looks lighter or darker. Now, don't despair by the fact that it looks like I'm taking off all the way down to bare wood. I'm really not. What's happening is there is still a little bit of wood grain texture on this and the uh, dust from the polyurethane is starting to fill in that, that uh, texture. Okay, so there it is, ready for another uh, second coat of polyurethane. And if I do have any concern that I've knocked the uh, finish down too far and started to expose bare wood, I could quickly do exactly what I did last night. Just take another rag with the oil-based wood stain and very quickly touch up the corners and edges where I think there's damage. But in this case, I don't think there actually is. So I'm gonna try just applying the next coat of polyurethane and see if this all disappears. I am gonna go ahead and take this paper towel and I'm just lightly damp and just see how much of this cleans up. Yeah, look at that. What looked like bare wood is actually just polyurethane dust. So I think we're actually okay here. Yeah, I think that's fine. Again, keep in mind the objective here is not to do a complete professional refinish, but just to do a surface refinish so that it looks a lot better than it did before and loses those sticker residue marks and the uh, chips and marks that are on there don't show up so much. Now in contrast to last night where I was uh, going over the rougher sanded lacquer and the oil-based stain, this here is just wiping on very, very smooth. It's almost like cleaning a mirror. And that's what you want to feel. Because I'm not going for a thick finish this time. I want to get just enough that I can see a faint gloss with minimal bubbles across the whole top surface here and then let it cure. So there we go. Repeat about five more times and hopefully this turns out nice. And if I really don't like the effect after the second time, I can sand it again and do the third and get a much more natural matte finish. The only thing to remember is that every time I do that, I'm filling more and more of the wood grain with a layer of polyurethane. So eventually it will just end up with a perfectly flat gloss finish, plus or minus a few minor imperfections, which may or may not be the look you're looking for. If you've got like a, something like oak with a really deep grain and you want to preserve some of that, Two very thinned coats, three at most, is all the further you're gonna to wanna to go. Once you get to about five or six, if it takes you that long, you're gonna end up with a gloss finish. Now that gloss finish will be fairly waterproof, just like a hardwood floor. So that has its advantages, but it depends on whether or not that's the application and the look you're going for. When assembling or reassembling furniture with drawers, it's important to make sure the slides are properly lubricated. Here we have metal slides with ball bearings and are using a modern silicone based lubricant. Older types of lubricants, sometimes still in use, include soft waxes such as beeswax or paraffin. The important thing is not to use a petroleum oil or grease, as these can impart an offensive odor to whatever is stored in the cabinet and can also collect dirt and grime that foul the slides. Additionally, they may shed bits and pieces of grime that can contaminate whatever is stored in the dresser. Last step is to reinstall the drawers, making sure that nothing is fouling or jamming. This turned out to be tricky as these particular slides are a bit difficult to get back together. Finally, we have and plan to enjoy a partially restored dresser.
Has anyone seen my phone?